right, John, over to you. Thank you. Just a second here. There we go. All right. Um, so three simple rules that I like to use when, when I run tactical decision games. Um, rule number one is if you're in the room, you're in the game. Uh, which means, no, I'm just here to observe, which I used to get a lot from senior officers who wanted to pop in and see what it was all about. So if you're in the room, you're in the game, you have to feel like you could be put on the spot at any moment because that's part of the responsibility of command. Rule number two is all decisions in the form of the orders that you will issue or the reports that you will submit. Um, Commanders take action by issuing orders, and that's a skill that improves with practice. Um, so we want you to uh, practice issuing your orders. Also, there's, there's a moral component to it. We want you to take responsibility for taking action for the situation. You can explain yourself later, and I'll give you a chance to do that, but action immediately is the important thing. So orders first and then discussion later. And then the third rule is leave your rank at the door. The only thing that matters is the quality of, of your decisions and your discourse. So um, the way that, that I enforce that is um, I have everybody go by call signs. So what I'd like you to do is open up the participant window, find your own name, and to the right of that, you'll see one of the options is more. If you click on that, there's an option for rename. I want you to just go ahead and uh, give yourself a cool uh, call sign like Dirty Ninja or uh, whatever. I go by Hannibal, which is the call sign that was given to me by my ROTC students when I was an instructor at the University of Illinois. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to go ahead and give yourself call signs. All right, we're mostly there, I think. Alex, go ahead and give yourself a call sign by uh, clicking on more next to your name and then just renaming yourself. All right, great. So um, that's the first thing. Second thing is if you go up to the top center of your screen, you'll see a bright green bar that says you're, you're sharing Hannibal screen to the right of that. You see, I think it's a red, red tab that says options. One of those options is annotate. Uh, open up that, pull down and click on annotate and that will pull up a toolbar which will allow you to annotate on the screen. So for example, you can use the draw option and you can draw on the screen like I'm doing right now in, in bright green highlighter, or you can, um, yes, you can write, you can also do text. Um, there's also a pointer function under spotlight. Um, so here I'm pointing at checkpoint 35, for example, here I'm pointing at hill 219. There's, um, there's first troop, second troop, third troop, fourth troop, and there's your armored troop. Um, so you can use that to point or you can draw as well. The eraser function allows you to erase things that, that you've drawn or that others have drawn. So this is, we're gonna use this to communicate and sort of to diagram what we're trying to do and that sort of stuff. So any questions about the administration before I kick this thing off? Nope, no, good. sounds good. Uh, great, all right, so here's the situation. You are the commander of an armored cavalry squadron guarding the right flank of the regiment as it advances north to contact on Highway 87. So Highway 87 is out here to the west, right? So the main body is moving up Highway 87. You're guarding the right flank along this trail here. You are about eight to 10 kilometers east of the main body, generally paralleling it as you move north along a dirt trail. The terrain is rolling and moderately vegetated. It is a clear night, about 20, 30 hours. You're fighting enemy armored and mechanized forces equipped with uh, Chinese equipment. So type 85, 87 or 88 main battle tanks, type 86 infantry fighting vehicles uh, or IFVs and uh, Whiskey Zulu 523 Armored Personnel Carriers, or APCs. Uh, your, they're essentially the equivalent of your basic T-72, your BMP, and, and your BTR-60. Your squadron consists of four troops of uh, four FV-510s each, 
and an attached armored troop of Challenger 2s. The FV-510 is armed, as you all know, with the 30 millimeter uh, L21A1 Rant, a Rardin cannon and a 7.62 coax machine gun. And the armored troop consists of four Challenger 2s armed with a 120 millimeter main gun with HE and armor piercing discarding Sabo. So first, second, third, and fourth troops and your armored troop there. Uh, as you near checkpoint uh, 35 on Highway 12, so you're approaching, so you're moving up the trail. Continuing your guard mission. As you near checkpoint 35 at Highway 12, you send first troop forward to take a look. Third troop is deployed to the north slope of Hill 211, guarding your right flank. Uh, second troop is halted west of the trail at the base of Hill 214. Um, the armored troop and, and fourth troop are behind you on the trail. So this is how you're deployed at this moment in time. Um, first troop leader urgently reports, enemy in sight, you'd better come take a look. So you hustle forward and join the first troop leader on the eastern finger of Hill 214, where his vehicles remain in defilade position. In your NVGs, you can see that Highway 12 is clogged with enemy vehicles heading west. About 10 Type 85, 88 main battle tanks. Um, um, are, are leading the column column and have already passed your position heading west. Following the tanks are about 10 Type 86 infantry fighting vehicles. And behind them, at least that many Whiskey Zulu 523s, which disappear into the darkness where uh, Highway 12 bends to the north. So they're, they, as far as you can see, uh, armored vehicles. You estimate that the column is moving at about 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. So Captain, what are you going to do? Any questions? about the scenario as it's been laid out here from anybody. Now's your chance. Uh, local um, people involved, like civilians in the area? No, not, not. I mean, some in Zamaville, yes, but uh, where you, you're operating, no. This is, not, this is not sort of a, a people's war kind of a, a situation. S Do we have yep, go start. So I was going to say, any OS support? Do we have any um, access to any fires over? Yes, absolutely. So you can request fires, you can request artillery, um, you can re request aviation support. John, um, um, what time of day and light conditions is it? Uh, it's a clear night. It's 20, 30 hours. What's the moon like there? uh pretty pretty good at the moment all right so it's pretty good at the moment <laughs> and the expectations are intelligence going into this area um, no it's it we're it was a well we've been fighting enemy armored and and mechanized forces um but it's it's a movement to contact so we don't have any firm intelligence uh the the main body is out looking for the enemy Regimental commander wants to find the enemy and destroy them. Any other questions, or are you just are you just are you just wasting my time while you while you think of your plan? <laughs> Morale of our guys, skill of them. Say again. Morale and skill of our guys. Well, I I imagine you're a pretty good combat leader, so they're imagine they're well trained and they will they will follow you through the gates of hell. Your guys, imagine your guys. Any UAB, other questions? UAV and I star? Nope. No. Nope. All right, I'm going to cut off the questions. I'm going to give you 60 seconds to come up with your decision in the form of the orders that you will issue to your five elements there and anybody else that you will make reports to or send requests for support to. John, and... uh, just one, one other question, sorry. The APCs, we've seen them move past us west as well. N no, they're about where you see them. Okay. Yeah. 
So the tanks have moved past. It looks like the infantry fighting vehicles are directly to your front and the APCs are still approaching checkpoint 35, but they disappear into the darkness where, where Highway 12 bends around to the north. I'm starting the clock. 60 seconds. <laughs> Thirty seconds. Not meaning to put any pressure on anybody. I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One time's up. Does that, that was fast. I realized that was really fast. Does anybody absolutely need more time? That's good because what you would discover, if my, guy, my guys know not to ask for more time because if they ask for more time, then I just immediately pick them. So, um, so good choice. Uh, you've passed the first decision test. Um, Honey Badger, let's hear it. Okay, can you uh, can you hear me? Okay, I'm working off an iPhone in a rubbish barracks. Uh, you know what? I, I don't care about your technology problems. Uh, I imagine cool. you probably have uh, communication issues in the field, so I'd rather hear your frag order. Cool, Allo Zero. This is Honey Badger. Sighting report: uh, Main battle tank platoon moving east to west, Highway 12. Uh, anticipated uh, contact at your position, heading north. Uh, figures uh, one zero. Uh, out to you, uh, one and two troop, maintain contact with uh, enemy IFV company heading east to west uh, in order to uh, in order to track their progress towards the enemy main uh, to the friendly main body. Three, four troop plus uh, challenger two, uh, the challenger two troop uh, delay via ambush uh, using the ground to the south of Highway Twelve. Uh, over. Roger, why don't you go ahead and diagram uh, what you got in mind? Not wishing to speak for me, Badger. You might have struggled to do that on an iPhone. Oh, that's true. That's right. I'm sorry. So, um, yeah, I didn't even think of that. So as I understand the frag order, thank you, whoever that was, you want um, third, fourth, and, and tanks to come around and ambush this way, and then first and second are going to, it, it sounded like you said just track and observe, or, did, or do you have first and second engaging? Uh, just track and observe for now. All right, so, so they're just going to watch the enemy drive by, and third, fourth, and tanks are going to swing around south of Hill 214 and ambush the tank company in the flank. Correct. Okay. And so what's the, what's the thinking there? So it's kind of uh, a Baz Basra Road scenario. If you can cut the tanks off at the front, the enemy will concertina up behind the, main, the, uh, behind the tank uh, troop or the tank company, sorry. And then one and two troop will be able to call in OS to uh, to destroy the remainder of the enemy main body as it moves towards the flank of the uh, battle group. Okay, and um, but you're not gonna you're not gonna use first and second to engage those IFVs with their organic weapons. Uh, not not yet because they're they're outnumbered. Okay. All right, Bambi. What do you think of um, Honey Badger's plan? Tell me one thing you like about it and one thing that you don't. Uh, so I like that it's in terms of you're, you're dealing with a primary threat. And I think from the mission, or as you've been told to guard the right flank. So you're dealing with a primary threat, which could continue along the axis. I think that what I don't like um, is, is the tracking. I think we're either going to, it, I don't think there's any reserve um, and there's been no use of OS. Uh, and those would be my two points over. 
OS is? Oh, um, offensive support, so fires. Over. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, I'm, I'm imagining Honey Badger was getting to the call for fire next, but maybe not. Honey Badger? No, yeah, so the, the, the intent for the first and second troop was to, uh, was to use the fires once they once they've got eyes on to the got it to the enemy okay. main body and the reason I I haven't uh, picked a reserve or annotated a reserve is because the risk here is uh, is so high to the enemy uh, wrong to the friendly main body that uh, that decision and speed of action and marching to the sound of the guns is more, is is the imperative over. All right, so you're making the argument that that you consider the reserve, but um, decided that you wanted to get everything into the fight because of the urgency of the situation. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So Bambi, what what do you think of that? So I think uh, because it's been been well articulated, that's a fair point. Um, I think the only problem is that we don't we're not sure if that's the if that's the full body um, of the enemy forces. Only what you've seen on the map so far. So I think although committing everything, I I agree. Um, it's it's a risk that you could take. Um, I personally would try to hold at least one troop in reserve just in case um, because we're not sure of the situation um, and maybe to be able to exploit success over. So, so so you suspect that there may actually be more coming around the bend here and we just can't see it yet. Um, it's either that or um, that there could be something coming to your right flank. You don't know. Um, the point here is that if you look, I think we're missing their reconnaissance element. Um, unless they are, I don't know if it's Chinese doctrine, if they lead, they may lead with their tanks like Russian doctrine. Um, but I think we may be missing a recce element forward of their MBTs. Um, and that's where I, I had something punching through to Hill 215 just to make sure that there wasn't any elements forward of the tanks. So, oh, so, it, so interesting thought here. So just because we, we don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So, so you're considering the possibility that something may have already passed by in advance of the tank company uh, that we don't even know about and that there may be more coming around that we don't know about in trace of the, the, um, the APC company. Yes. 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 Uh, so, so that's why I'm maintaining a reserve. So, um, Java, what do you think? You're on mute. There we go. Unmute. There we go. Um, I good. Pretty much. I mean, I had the same thing. I, I mine. Uh, my initial take is you can hear me, right? The, uh, yes, absolutely. Is that uh, they're in column on the road? They don't see us. We see them. They're in the kill box right now. We need to be ready. So. I want to hold them there, tell Zomaville, uh, tell the 2nd Regiment that this is coming. It's going to be there in a second. My second issue is, uh, hey, guys, call for fire, get some smoke. So they button up and they're they're going to be suspicious, slow down, et cetera. Get, um, get the 2nd uh, Platoon over that hill, start hitting them. The 4th Platoon. Right, so, so Javis, you're giving your plan. I'll give you a chance to do that in a minute. Oh, what I'm do you sorry. think about, no, that's fine. What do you think about the discussion so far and the, and the idea that we may have actually missed their recce element and that there may be more re reinforcements coming from behind. And as a result, it's in the, under those circumstances, we'd be better off with a reserve. It's quite possible. Um, and I'm okay with that. If that recce element gets through, if the main body is still bogged down, they're not going to be a threat. I want, uh, you know, I, and I do think um, Bambi, I think it was Bambi had a, a good point. I want, you know, the third to keep a lookout to the rear. What does keep a lookout to the rear mean? They're going to be screening on, the, on our right flank. So the, the um, I think it was Bambi who brought this point up. Yes. Who, who actually is thinking that maybe we're, we, we may also be seeing a move like this. Is yeah. that what you meant, Bambi? And so third troop from, from their current position, it looks like they could actually engage checkpoint 35 and still screen the right flank of our position so that we don't get surprised by something coming around the south side of Hill 219. Am I putting words in your mouth, Bambi? No, sir. That's it. Uh, uh, Odin, what do you think? Um, I think in respect to uh, what we're not seeing, uh, I'm not actually worried about recce elements in front of the the tanks because they're they're moving towards a a regiment that we that we're guarding. I'm more concerned about what's behind them. Um, but if my job is to guard, then the, this this plan strikes me as the right thing to do. Okay, so what what does that recce element do 
if we if we clobber the tanks and the IFVs in the flank in the kill box here, do they they continue bopping down the road towards Zamaville or do they turn back? What how how do you how do you read the enemy story here? I think um, I think it's not it's 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 too small for me to be worried about if there is a recce element in front of them they're sandwiched between the the unit that they're trying to to screen for um that, that's being attacked all right and they're noise the regiment they're just going to run into yeah they're, they're they're round off air so nothing to to bother yourself about and get distracted by your focus needs to be on the tanks and the ifds in the kill box yeah absolutely yeah. doom had it doom had a point he wanted to make I did. I think there's a risk in this kind of thing of looking at what's visible on the map and nothing else uh, and losing sight of what we're here to do. Um, I think being the flank guards, what we are, we're here primarily to report on this, this column appearing, but also the ideal situation is that we can make them, we can make them engage us. Um, and I do think that means that the looking at it in terms of destroying the elements that are currently pictured on the map is, is perhaps too short sighted because we are probably outnumbered severely. But if we can force them to deploy and engage us, that's time which the which the the main body will have available to to okay. um, to deal with it. So so um, doctrinally, I don't know if it's different um, for you. We have three levels of, of security mission: screen, guard, cover. So screen means primarily just to report. It, there's no there's no requirement to delay the enemy. Guard is a fighting mission. Guard is you're actually providing physical protection and are expected to fight. To, to provide protection to the main body. And then cover is you are a self-contained covering force outside of artillery distance and uh, our self-contained combined arms force. So this mission is more than just a report mission. This is a provide physical protection to the main body by engaging and delaying the enemy uh, as necessary. Now, typically, typically you do that by, by orienting on the main body and staying between the main body and any enemy forces. That's kind of OBE, I think, because he's already past us so at this point we're we're sort of improvising and coming up with another way to to protect the main body but there's still the protection mission uh, or am i getting it wrong am i am, am is the doctrine a little bit different on your side um baldrick is this from baldrick from uh black adder uh yeah okay yeah very good are you impressed that i that i, I get the cultural reference uh yeah not everybody does not everybody over here does. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so um, it, it guard is a protect mission for you as well, not just a report mission. Uh, so I'm a civilian, so I don't know what it's like for the military guys. Um, I'm more, uh, there's something in front of us, uh, we should go clobber it. Well, so talk about that. Um, so what's your thinking? Why don't you go ahead and give us your frag order? Uh, so my first plan was very similar to the uh, the first one we heard, uh, which is to um, obviously whilst phoning the contact in, so the rest of the force knows about it, uh, uh, move the tanks up to the shoulder of Hill 2114, uh, then they can... Uh, so, so instead of explaining it, I want you to actually give, issue the orders that you would issue, right? Just the way that you would do okay, it yeah. over the radio. Yeah, so... Tank platoon to advance to the south shoulder of Hill 214 with second platoon in support and it's snap ambush uh, to the road, essentially. Or well, snap ambush left. That's it? That's it. Everybody else can stay where they are because they're going to provide security, uh, like first and second, first and third platoons, and then fourth platoon is there in reserve okay so so what's your thinking uh the thinking is kind of admittedly kind of minor tactical which is uh the challenges should be just judging off the contours in uh kind of keyhole not keyhole uh flanking defilade there uh if that column's moving down the road well first of all you've got a good line down the actual highway. So if there are any elements that have gone past us, we should be able to see them with the thermals. Uh, secondly, when the enemy tank come around the corner, 
uh, they should be able to hit them in the flank. Uh, and it's, you know, hold down defilade. So it's an advantageous engagement. Okay. In, in theory, if it is, because it's All just right. a map. All right. Uh, that's the main uh, enemy combat power element uh, is his armor, essentially. So I want to engage that first. Okay. So, so what's the thinking behind uh, committing 20% of your comp? Well, one fifth of your elements, it's probably more than 20% of your combat power, but, but one fifth of your capabilities and just holding fast with the other 80%, that's a huge reserve. Um, I don't know that Bambi would, would be in, encouraging us to keep four elements in reserve and commit only one, would he? Bambi? Uh, no, sir. I think I had just a single troop in reserve. Okay. Um, All right. But, but anyway, so, so uh, Baldrick, what's the thinking on keeping that many forces out of the fight? Um, when you said what you saw, it's, it's see the enemy, clobber the enemy, I think is what you said to me. Um, and, and you just commit one out of five elements to do it. Uh, yeah, my... Uh, uh, the concept is that if it's a tank company, it's only... Uh, uh, it's 10 enemy tanks, like four challenges on 10 T-72s. Yeah. Uh, once that's gone, then the challenges pretty much have free reign because it, BMP equivalent isn't particularly... Uh, a massive threat to the challenges. No, but it is a threat to, to, the, um, to the 510s, right? which is why they're not engaged. Okay. All uh, right. Unless, you know, they need to be. If, uh, if the, the Red Force decides to just come straight over the hill, then they should be all reverse So let's, so let's talk sloped. about that. A hurricane. Um, the, the, our, our challengers get into hull deflate positions and they engage the, the main battle tanks in, um, in a flank ambush. What what does the rest of the red column do at this point? I ask you, not knowing the sort of unique doctrine, I would say that uh, the red tank company would turn to face. The BMP uh, follow-on company might uh, stop deploy and push dish mounts onto the hill in a hope to sort of flank the tanks uh, with handheld weapons. Okay. Uh, and they would probably use some kind of OS... Um, to try and neutralize or screen the effectiveness of the challenges. Um, that depends on the orders they've been given. If they were held for leather going down, which I don't think they are given the speed was 15 kph, they could just drop off a troop of tanks to fix and keep going. But that's uh, I, I don't think they do that given the sort of speed they were going thus far. Okay. So, but the, um, I guess what I was getting at is um, if we're going to just hold our positions on the north side of Hill 214, uh, it's very likely that they're going to move and, and try to occupy that terrain. And now we've got the enemy with the high ground and us below them uh, on the east side of the hill um, because we ceded the initiative to them. Yes? No? Uh, that would be a fair assessment. Uh, uh, colonial, colonial had, uh, had a, a point. Yeah. We said holding the position, whether we secede the initiative by withdrawing from it, so that we would want to withdraw to have the reverse slope on them. So anybody that comes over that hill, you're going to whack with an entire company's worth of uh, reconnaissance or dropping artillery on the reverse side of the slope right on top of their head. So either way, they lose. Uh, I think staying put on the ridge line of that hill is the wrong call. Uh, so you don't think getting into hull defilade positions and engaging the enemy in the kill box is the way to go? Well, the to kill box first... is further down the road, I feel, rather than at this point. You, okay. don't want to, you don't want to declare how far your flank guard is. Okay. How? Um, who else had their hand up? Yeah, I've, I've got my hand up. I'm just uh, reinforcing this sort of, but that's... Um, I'm not sure who spoke first, but I think it was Baldrick, because... You know, uh, a tank platoon coming into the flank of a tank company in line of march on a road, and and sorry, I missed the initial, I missed the initial brief, but this is at night. Yes. Is yeah, it's at night. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I got on this late. So um, I I think that's a fantastic uh, 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 decision. 
the stock fact there of four challengers of eight, or even two or three into the flank of that company from the side at what less than a kilometer oh, which is about, blank, about really, a so. kilometer to 1500 meters it looks like yeah so yeah, yeah you know, so just say that the tanks yes uh completely agree with that it was more the um first platoon i was talking about right yeah and and first first platoon are, are too close first platoon need to be coming back um you know we've got eyes on with three we've got eyes on with four and I absolutely agree we're on the reverse slope of Hill 214. If um, if the uh, the red advance guard, if that's what this is, comes up this up the slope, then fantastic. You know, it's it's probably the best. Um, I think one if for my call, one platoon would be coming back through two, uh, falling back through two, and two would be covering them as they re so one becomes our reserve. I okay. wouldn't cross the valley. I, yeah, yeah, back there somewhere. That would that would be my call. But I think the shock action, uh, you know, we too too few times we take account of shock uh, and uh, you know demoralization. Um, you know, a, 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 a shot into the flank of the uh, of the tank uh, company is, I think, exactly the correct uh, call. Okay, so if I, if I understand you correctly, what you're suggesting is the kill box is the way I've drawn it here. Well, the, the kill box for the, the IFVs and, and possibly the BTRs, that, that we actually withdraw from 214, expect them to, to push into that position, and then we ambush them with the entire company of uh, um, 510s rather than just first platoon up on the high ground. Yeah, and, and, and kill box Boxes are great, but they're static. So you're, you're reading the situation in terms of what the enemy is doing. The kill box will move depending on their counter to this. Sure, sure. Uh, but know, if, but I, if what I, we're envisioning if our role, Go ahead, I'm sorry. Sorry if, if, sorry, if our role is to protect the flank of the second battalion moving north, which uh, I see that from the, uh, the, 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 the diagram to the left, then we're doing our job. We're doing our job by observing and blumping and reporting. And whether or not we stay there as a fan guard or not is not really our call. We've done our job. Okay. Java, you had a point. Yeah. Um, I, on the idea of let's wait for him to go further down the road, um, these are tanks in the woods on a clear night. We're not sneaking up on anybody. The fact that we caught them on the road is amazing. Uh, we got to take advantage of it. Every second counts. Get engaged. That's just my thought. So, so what? Okay, so what does that look like? Let's let's have your frag order. Let's, okay. I told you I'd give you a chance to give your frag order. So I'm yep, going to give yep, you yep. a chance to give I'm your frag gonna, order. We got to work the controls here now. View options, annotate. So I think I can. Uh, are you moving the parts? I am. Okay. Uh, let's put the uh, tank. Uh, yeah, that sort of reset there. Yep. <clears throat> So uh, first thing, get on the radio, let uh, second regiment know this is happening. All right. Well, so, so talk That's to second over. regiment that this is Hannibal. Yep. Hey, Hannibal. Um, we've got an element moving to you. You're going to be in contact in a couple of minutes. We're going to quest smoke to uh, button them up. We're going to distract them while we um, engage them right now. Um, I've got the first platoon right there. I've got the second platoon basically ready to go. Uh, let me see, where's my little arrow uh, draw thing? Okay. Nope. All right, so, you, so you've given your report to hire. So yep. let's, let's hear the frag. Um, probably not doing it. And uh, I don't practice this area, but um, so it would be, uh, um, we're, all units, hey, we're going to engage. I'm sending the second regiment um, towards the the column, uh, the fourth. Sorry, that's the fourth platoon uh, to the uh, west of Hill 214, and I'm keeping uh, the third platoon to the right in the gap between two uh, 219 and 211 to screen for other action. Um, depending on how this goes, the uh, tank element is going to be my reserve or finishing force. 
If things go well, I'm going to ask them to move towards checkpoint 35 and engage whatever's there. So, so tanks reserved, be prepared to um, uh, attack yeah. checkpoint 35. Yeah. And second, second platoon I missed, troop. You call them troops, right? Yeah. So what is second doing? Second is just moving to the top of the hill and engaging. All right. So first, second, and fourth are all just immediately um, taking up firing positions and engaging the enemy in the flank. Are you going to try to orchestrate this so that they all open fire at once? In other words, are you going to tell first to sit on order and wait for fourth to maneuver into position? No. Or are you just going to tell them and uh, engage the enemy uh, when they come to bear? When they come to bear, as soon as you have a shot, take it. Uh, chaos is on our side. They don't know us. They don't see it. Um, yeah, take advantage of everything, especially when uh, we have some smoke or uh, some art arty coming in there. So do we have smoke and arty coming in too? Yeah, that was my original plan was to have um, something dropping on them. I mean, if, we, if I have air support too, I mean, they're in column on a on a moonlit night. Okay, Redcoat, what do you think? So this is a very different plan. This is smash them in the, smash them in the flank as quickly as we can with everything we can bring to bear, basically, with accepting reserve and, and protecting our flank. But very different than what we've been talking about withdrawing off of Hill 214. Redcoat, go. I say, yeah, my, my kind of feeling was is set in the narrative that the armoured squadron had already moved past our position. So I think we'd be doing a bit of a uh, chasing a moving target with the artillery uh, kind of creeping down Route, tw route 12. And so my feeling with the uh, column moving down to the west is that with our vehicles stationary as they are shown there, how long we'd be able to create an effect, uh, create an effect for Yes. I think there's, all, there's also the slightly unresolved issue of the enemy forces where, which have gone out of sight uh, to the northern edge of uh, Hill 219 as well, um, which I don't think have been mentioned yet. Right. We have talked about the possibility that there's more coming, right? That, that there's always there's kind of this tendency to sort of assume that what you see is all there is. Um, and we've, we've already opened up the possibility that there may be more in front that we missed and that there's more coming from behind that, that we haven't seen yet. And so that we may be dealing with a, with a, uh, a much bigger formation than, than we'd originally considered. So do I understand that your, your thinking is that um, by taking up the positions that we've seen here, that um, with the, the, we may risk letting the enemy get past us because we've taken up static positions? Yeah, I think so. I think it kind of plays into how we interpret the guard mission as well, how aggressive we see that. And I do think uh, that with the uh, armoured troop that we have as well, we don't know what else is in the main body, but I think we're as well placed as anyone to engage and uh, do more damage to uh, their armour than not necessarily just with OS. Okay. And... Um... So you're thinking you need to get the challengers into this fight. Um, yeah, I think so. From, from the, the um, so whose plan is this? I'm sorry, I've lost, I've lost track. Who, who are we? Who are we talking about here? Who gave this order? Oh, I did Java. Java. Thank you, Java. Yes. So was your thinking that it's going to be fourth platoon slash troop that's going to be engaging the enemy tanks? No, they're my ace in the hole. I think. Uh, um, no, fourth, fourth platoon, which is on the, the southwestern oh, slope yeah. of. So, yeah, yeah. so, so, be... so, what are the what are the um, five tens going to do against um, Type eighty fives? With a... I'm not exactly sure what their armament is, but they can't be. They're not naked, right? They have something. Right? Say, 
so I can I can probably answer that. So the thirty mil Raden unfortunately has uh, two two issues in this in this circumstance. One it isn't a stabilized turret, so I, I know the Americans will be shocked to hear this, um, and it's only got a three round. So the point is, if we're what if we're talking over a kilometer, um, it will be ineffective against an MBT from either the front or side. So the only thing that really can engage it from the force elements you've got is the one twenty millimeter. Um, from the the CR2, we don't have any ATGMs um, like a, an, an M3 would, um, so a TOE 2B or something like that from from our 510s. So you're kind of relying on it probably being um, in a reverse slope and then coming on to you, um, and then you firing point blank is the only way you'll defeat MBTs. Um, the the BMPs and the uh, whatever the APC equivalents are, you you've probably got a chance to defeat over. You're right. So do, you, would, do, your, do your dismount crews um, not have uh, man portable ATGMs? So, so um, we can ask, um, there's a call sign on here that would know well. Um, so we'd have either Javelin or, or Enlaw and, we, and we've seen the impact. So yeah, you'd have to dismount, but you wouldn't right. be able to fire, fire mounted over. Got it. Understood. So, so, so one of the oddities of the British recce is there is no, there is no dismount in the, in the recce troop. So, there is uh, not. Uh, it's not it's not how we roll in the uh wow the okay well all right so i didn't realize that um that does make it a lot harder doesn't it nobody's Absolutely. saying anything. there's i figured there's you know at least a javelin in each one of those uh but i guess not all right red coat you had your hand up hi sorry so yeah you asked me to comment um i'm have to throw my plan in the mix uh, if you want to generate a bit more discussion, what, are you are you volunteering to do that? It may as well. There's no point being the uh, spare dick at the orgy. So, okay, all right. Uh, so, so I'll be true to what I scribbled down in the thirty seconds, which is important. Which is important. I uh, uh, one thing that I noticed when I run TDGs is is um, as you go along, the the solutions always seem to get better. And for some reason, they always manage to incorporate all the best elements of the previous solutions. I don't know how that is, uh, since everybody is supposedly taking the solution that they that they gave after one minute. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, Red Roger, coat, I'm, you're also, up. I'm afraid on an iPhone, so I won't be able to move anything or draw That's all right. Anything. So, so you know what? You're given your frag orders over the radio. People are having to interpret them anyway. So I will do my best. Roger, so my uh, briefing to my troops is first troop, you'll continue to guard to the north. Second troop and armored squadron can uh, pursue to the east in order to disrupt the enemy main battle tanks. Third pursue squadron. To, uh, break, break, pursue to the east? Yeah. East. Uh, sorry, west. Sorry. Roger that. That shows the time pressure I was under, sir. And I'm right. left handed. Keep going. Uh, third, third squadron, you're to guard, move to the vicinity of Hill 219 in order to confirm enemy dispositions. Fourth troop, you're to remain in reserve. Messages to higher reporting that you've got an enemy armoured column uh, moving west down the, down the road, requesting OS in the low ground between uh, spot heights 215 and 218. Uh, break, break, um, red coat. This is um, this is Slappy One. Um, this is your friendly uh, section of gunships uh, uh, reporting on station, um, ready to do your bidding. Roger, happy you've forgotten your call sign already. But uh, Slappy, Slappy One, Slappy One. Uh, I'll give you priorities. Enemy uh, main battle tanks. Uh, moving west along the uh, road, nearest friendly call sign, approximately kilometer and a half uh, south, however, moving to engage uh, those forces along the road. Over. Roger that. So I'm, I'm just going to make a run up the road here and uh, uh, engage the main, any main battle tanks that I see on Highway 12. Yes? Yeah, uh, it, yeah I've got uh, blue and blue flash, blue on blue flashing through my head at the moment. Um, but. So let's talk about that. I mean, it's it's the middle of the night. It's it's uh, an improvised fight, basically. So how how are we gonna how are we gonna prevent fat fratricide here? How are we gonna organize this battle space so that we can minimize the the chances for fratricide once we bring something like um, attack helicopters into the game? Colonial. So you, 
If I'm right in saying you've got forward line of troops, so the argument saying that anything north of um, road, I uh, don't know what it would be called or referenced as, uh, is free fire. Anything south of that is... Right, so, uh, so hostiles on the road or north of the road, friendlies to the south. Yes. Yeah. Easy. I, I, yeah, I like it. I mean, it's 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 uh, it would seem to be fail safe. It's really simple. It's something that can be conveyed by by you know word of mouth over the radio in the middle of the night. Uh, it's not something that requires an overlay to be sent out to all the subordinate units and that sort of thing. So um, it's yeah, it's improvising based on on what the situation is giving you um, to just keep it really simple. I love it, uh, Bambi. What do you think? No, I agree. I think from my perspective um, that that would be the quickest thing and easiest way, either along the road or north of the road. Over. Yeah. All right. Um, anyway, Red Redcoat, back to you. And then to David Redpath, which sounds like an Indian name. So, so that's, that's all I had scribbled down. Um, so uh, I'm not going to elaborate. Well, so uh, well, let me ask you a question. As, as first troop, you told me to continue to guard to the north. I'm, I'm yep. not sure I understand what that means. Can you give me a tactical task? Am I engaging those infantry fighting vehicles? What am I doing? So that's why I think guard covers it because uh, guard, and I'm afraid I don't have any doctrine in front of me um, to confirm, but uh, guard can uh, can engage enemy forces if identified. So by giving them guard as opposed to just screen or defeat, it's giving that troop commander the latitude to see what's there, whatever else is coming and continue to fulfill the function that we were actually given by hire. Right. So, so, I mean, so guard was the mission that, that our squadron was given and we're guarding, we're protecting the main body that's moving up Highway 87. If first platoon or, or first troop, I'm sorry, is guarding, who are they, who are they protecting here and what, and what are they orienting on? I, I think in this situation, I'm looking for a more specific task, um, you know, um, firing positions, hold death hill 214, engage the IFVs, IFVs to your north. Oh, Something. yeah. Okay. So maybe point for discussion. I'm not sure. I don't see that as being the bigger threat. So uh, in hurried orders, I'd be content, I think, and stand to be corrected or challenged that by giving the troop commander uh, a mission there to happy, because that's, that's essentially the holding. So maybe guard focus on uh, whatever the crossing point is there, three, three, five, um, holding on that point whilst then the other pursuer is going on to their rear. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I'd give them any any more direction because we know the um, the enemy BMPs, are they moving or what are they going to do once, uh, once their main battle tanks get engaged? So I don't want to be too specific with that first troop leader. Okay, but you've, you've kind of, you've, um, as I understand the logic of your plan, the, 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 the tanks and second troop are going to engage the main battle tanks, right? I mean, so you've, you've taken care of that part of the enemy force, but, you, but you're stopping short of specifying who's, who's responsible for taking out the, the IFVs. Yeah, so I kind of, I don't know, anyone else feel free to chip in, but I kind of think if the, you're given the guard mission, with enemy force to your front, then you're able to engage. Okay, so so you would you would say by by giving that task to first troop that that they would be free to engage those the IFVs to their front. Yeah, I think so. Unless I'm uh, wildly wrong. No, I think they yeah. I think they certainly would. I, I my question was, it, would they interpret that tasking to mean that they should engage the IFVs? Um, Red Path, you had you've had your hand up. Well, I think, um, I think it's a real good uh, question about what you do with one platoon in this in this particular scenario because they're real close to a lot of enemy um, and they, they have no standoff capability. So we're talking about, you know, 500 meters to 1,000 meters good kill range. Um, they don't, you know, just if you just look at the, at, at the force ratio here, um, I think my orders to uh, to one platoon would be keep eyes on three five point three five, but right. do not get engaged with anybody else there because because you, you you're just going to lose it like very badly. Four platoon further back can check uh, and three as they've been positioned on two one nine, but back on the original uh, overlay, uh, you know we can see anything coming down the valleys from the east. We can see anything coming down the valley from the north, and from, uh, the from trick here is you know. 
Yeah. Um, 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 it, even if Street Platoon didn't go to 219, because I think because I, I, I just can't remember, I can't visualize the original laydown, you know, at the minute that the, the contact was made. But I think Street Platoon had just, you know, was on the, the north the north side of 211, I think. They were just up here. Um, yeah. So so this is a three yeah. kilometer, this is a at least a three kilometer move for them. And by the time yes. they get in by the time they get into position there, so moving at night, um, you know, this is probably what if they're moving at a kilometer every four minutes, that's it's just 15 minutes for them to get there. And yeah. now they're separated from the rest of the squadron by a good four kilometers. And outside yeah. of the and, and that's going to yeah, and it's also going into unknown territory. You know, we've seen what we've seen, but we haven't seen what we don't know. You know, we don't know what we don't know here. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I think I'd be less inclined to split through off of that way, although I get the logic of it. But um, but my point here is that, you know, light reconnaissance, which is three quarters of our, our actually four fifths of our force, um, it can only be killing things from ambush and from defilade. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, so you don't, you don't, think, that, out, you don't think the first platoon has that is in position to do that right now? Uh, well, I'm, from where they are now, but I, but I think at the start they were further back in the woods, just on the on the reverse side, two one four. If I if I'm correct, they so were first, sort of first platoon, element, is, first platoon is essentially when this when the scenario starts or when when we make yeah. when we spot the enemy, this is where first platoon is. So they're in hull def or they're in defile position. And just on the reverse slope of, of the northern part of, of Hill 214. So they're about a kilometer away from the infantry fighting vehicles, which are showing their flank directly in front of them. I think Java would say, let them have it. Yes? Java? Did we lose Java? Um, perhaps I don't see. Yeah, yeah I don't see must him must on Colonial, you got your yeah. hand up. Yeah, um, just suddenly occurred to me uh, after can discussing. I make, can I make just one last point? Can sure. I make just one yeah, last sure. point before sure. I use? And, and that is reference deconflicting the attack air. Um, uh, my my regiment took uh, factor side losses in Gulf War One uh, from air, so I'm a little bit uh, um, sensitive to it. Um, the strobes. We put IR strobes um, on the top of every vehicle. And uh, I'm not sure. What, I'm not sure what the helicopters are, but they, you know, they'll have IR slash thermal, so we can identify who we are very easily. Um, and uh, depending on the night sights or the frequency that the uh, the red is in, then we may or may not reveal ourselves, especially if it's shielded. So I think I think we were, the the cut line to avoid fratricide from the attack helicopters as they're coming in is actually anything on the north. Northwest side of 214 is enemy. Anything on the south or southeast side of 214 is friendly. That's I think that's the cut. I don't think it's the road. Okay. Because we'll get we'll get, you know, if they get hit from the flank by the tanks, then they're gonna come up that slope on the 214. That's my IA. So I think yes, I think that's a deconfliction line. Thank you very much. That's exactly what I was thinking. Over. Okay. Less um, I mean less easy to convey that to people and and less distinctive i think i mean everybody knows the road any nobody's really going to mistake the road um uh, whilst people are not going to mistake the road i think david's hit a really important point there that sorry people are stupid and when you're flying about and trying to dodge aa north is going to become south and south is going to become north so having a line that's at two points of reference means that you can orientate yourself so if you're ducking in behind 215 popping back up or um 218 etc you know you're not may not know which direction you're facing at that point so just having that one point of reference doesn't help but yeah i, I agree that more effort needs to be made than just say shoot north got it okay understood yeah. Um, um yeah so the what was it what was the point we we're going to make before david sorry i've completely forgotten it um yeah, that was it. Um, we've missed a very important point in this discussion. It's only occurred okay. to me at that point. We've missed the strategic picture of what's happening. We've gone, ooh, target, let's shoot. Um, instead of going, right, our guard, job is guard. Yes, we need to protect their flank. We've done our job of engaging, slowing down with the armored platoon and the second platoon here and raiding up to 
second regiment saying hey you've got contact on your right however they the commander of the second regiment might decide to push through and not worry about that and let follow-on forces deal with this armored thrust coming in so following up and staying on their side might be an important point and whether it's a good idea or not i'm not sure i want to discuss it that pushing up that route that we're continuing on letting armor platoon second platoon first platoon deal with this kill box that we've generated on the road pushing up through through this trail and getting third platoon fourth platoon into the flank of second regiment that's maybe continuing on maybe having somebody in the rear and using smoke and artillery fire to cut, isolate and cut off the kill box from uh, our forces. We're going to try and push up on that flank. So if I understand what you're suggesting, um, you're saying it's the wrong color. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, it's the wrong color. Uh, no, that pushing along the trail to try and get in and maintain that flank guard for us. Right, so third and fourth sort of making this move and continuing the flank guard mission as higher headquarters continues up Highway 87. Yeah, so on that radio call to second regiment, finding out what higher command's intention is, given the contact. Okay, um, Odin, you've been awfully quiet. So let's develop the situation here a little bit. And uh, I'm going to pull third platoon back for now um, into this position. But I'm going to say that that um, first platoon is reporting that um, we're seeing more infantry fighting vehicles um, as the, the APCs continue to move. We're seeing more IFVs behind them. And Slappy is also reporting that there seems to be an armored column or mechanized column that uh, just continues much further to the north um, and that we've got, we've got a whole lot more coming at this point. Um, how does this change the situation for you and what do you do about it? Um, I don't think it necessarily changes the situation. It just, um, other than confirming what, what, I would suspect, which is that there's there's more behind them. Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, the important thing here is reporting to the regiment so they can react. And I okay. think I'm, I would continue with setting my ambush, but uh, because I, I'm wanting to halt that column or just to at least force them to deploy and deceive them about the, the strength of my position. Um, but since they're much larger, I'm now also thinking about how I'm going to withdraw and 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 screen, I guess, after the ambush has sprung. OK, um, backing up one step, Colonial, was it you who suggested that third and fourth should continue to push north uh, and continue the guard mission? Yeah, but I think you're right. It's, it's a developed plan. So given first platoon sightings of additional forces, that would rescind it. But then that puts a problem on uh, second regiment commander because he's now no longer going to have a flank guard. OK, um, so yeah. before before first platoon makes this report and, and the attack helicopters confirm it. Um, not knowing that, but but understanding that there's the possibility of it, would that change your thinking about pushing third and fourth troops north of Highway 12, where they're now in danger of being cut off from the rest of the squadron by follow on enemy forces. Being cut off for an hour is, again, that's why I want to open it up to discussion. I think it's an idea to push on through and that, you know, worst comes to worst, they can come west and meet up with um, Second Regiment. Sure. Um, so they can swing back and, and link up with the main body that way. Exactly. Um, yeah. So it. It is a developed plan. It is not an, a, a snap plan that was right. developed. Yeah. Okay. Red path. Yeah, I, th I think the, the 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 point that's just been made about remembering what our role is in in conjunction with Second Regiment, I thought was a very very great point. And I think one of the other things that, although it would be in reality, I think it would be quite hard to do on the move, is I think that. There would be some suggestion 
it's it's usually a good reconnaissance trait to give suggestions to your hire as to what you would uh, you know um, have said advice. Okay, uh, what second, would, so what would second, you advise? Second, second battalion. Um, you know, you can kill a complete battalion of reds here by getting into an ambush position. Uh, you know, on the reverse slope of turn one five and um, uh, the, the wood, which isn't named, just to the to the northeast of Zamerville. Uh, I mean, it's if I'm gonna if I can't ambush this red column and cause it anything more than discomfort with one platoon of tanks. But uh, you know, an ambush, an ambush position from the wood to the northwest, uh, northeast. Yes, there, and on the uh, reverse slope, or sorry, on the uh, yeah, the slope there, um, you kill a lot of them. We don't, we don't have to do it. You know, that's uh, I'm assuming. Uh, it's sorry, it's it's marked as a as a mechanized infantry brigade, but presuming that they've got heavy heavier weapons. So um, I, I think you know. Getting an ambush position now, and we will just keep out of your way, and you can kill them all as they come down the road. Thank you. So, are are you suggesting that we actually want to sort of draw them forward uh, into into the waiting ambush? That we're now the fixing force that that grabs them by the nose and 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 sucks them in? Is that? I, I think that's a tough up. Operation at night in you know about without any sort of pre rehearsal here. I think this is really that's I, I hear what you're saying, and you know, theoretically, that would be great. I think we would do very well to kill a few tanks at the front, make them pause, and then everybody else get back into that valley around the on the southeast side of 214 and keep watching. But I think my, my main point is advise the second regiment that there's a, a potential kill box exactly where you've got the attack helicopters actually there. And, um, you know, uh, I think that's worth saying. Because, because the, the, the second um, battalion's commander is getting sporadic sit reps. He's getting sporadic contact reports. You know, we're telling him everything that we're telling him, but we're not telling him what we think it means for him. Over. Okay. Uh, Dirty Ninja, what do you think? You've been listening to the conversation. Why don't you set us straight? <laughs> yeah, I've been listening in a multi multitasking here. No, it's been a great conversation, John, and uh, a lot of great ideas here. It, uh, I I would uh, I would have the air, you know, we, we establish a flood and then have the air do a lot of interdiction and have them clean up on those tanks. Um, and as all as well as uh, call in fires uh, north northeast of the thirty five Cessna TRPs. Um, to lay in fires. Um, those are some thoughts. Over. Um, so um, break, break. The, um, Ninja, this is uh, third troop. Um, we got uh, enemy infantry fighting vehicles approaching from the east on the south side of Hill 219, uh, approximately 25, uh, 22.5 clicks. Uh, how copy? Over. Copy. Uh, establish a blocking position um, and have fourth troops uh, reinforce support by fire. On Hill 211, over. Okay, so does this? How does this change things? And does this does this change things? Yeah, it makes it much more dynamic, and uh, you're gonna have to really, as a leader, establish some really good control measures to make sure we don't have any uh, fracture side, some blue on blue, um, as, as we as we you know integrate air, and uh, OS as the Brits would say, yeah. um, fires. Uh, Evan, we haven't heard from you yet. Um, how does this new development change things for you? I think it makes a withdrawal necessary uh, down the line. I'm not sure if it initially affects the plan on a attack against forces moving along the highway. Initially, my change to the initial plan would be to withdraw first and third after maybe some initial engagement to get the enemy to deploy and stop for a moment, then withdraw using smoke to cover their withdrawal and then probably retreat. Draw to where? Uh, withdraw southwest, uh, probably to the 
gully between 215 and 228. The saddle here. Yeah. Okay. And same for third? Yes. Uh, potentially there would be value in holding there or holding on the forward slope to set up another kill box if they try and come down south. Okay. But, but your basic idea is trade space for time, fall back to the next successive, you know, um, favorable terrain and, and then do it again and, and hit them again. Yeah. There's more forces here than I can deal with, with the forces I have available to me. Therefore, mm -hmm. my job is to preserve force to allow for uh, higher units to either call in supporting fires or bring more forces in to deal with the enemy. Okay. Uh, who had their hand up? Doom. Yeah, I do. I do worry about this being a little bit too passive. Um, you, you're quite correct that we can't take them on a head-on fight, but given that, given our job, um, we're here to we're here to report on their position, and we're here. I, th I think our goal is to again force them to deploy against us, if we can engage them enough so that they are that they change their action then then we've succeeded in our job and then then at that point we can pull out i think if we start putting out just because there's a lot of them i think there's i think there's a good good chance that we, we're just completely ineffectual we may as well not be there at that point uh david redpath did you have your hand up or were you that was a thumbs up that was a th thumbs up exactly we, 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 need to, we need to let them know that we're there but then stop and then get out i absolutely agree with the last okay uh, G Mover, am, am I pronouncing that right? Yes, no, G Mover, no answer. Heka, we haven't heard from you yet. What's your thinking as as the situation develops here? Well, I think that will uh, fix the enemy along the highway at twelve, and uh, then wait for the regiment battalion to uh, attack him in the flank from uh, west to east along the highway so so this is interesting so you are you're now sort of thinking at the the regimental level and suggesting that that the regiment is going to attack this way or were you suggesting that the regiment was going to come in like this uh, uh from uh, west along the highway it's highway 12 so so yeah. straight up straight up this way yeah okay so i will fix him in the flank and uh, have him uh, occupied, and then uh, suggesting the regiment to attack along the highway. And and so okay, so you're a squadron commander recommending a course of action to the regiment. Um, why why do you feel confident doing that? Because I am the one uh, having uh, the eyes on the enemy out there. Uh -huh. so I think I have the best uh, possibility to come okay. with that uh, suggestion. But they could also say, uh, uh, turn me down and say, that's your problem. We are heading north. And, right. Uh, well, so, so I, I mean, I, I didn't give a complete mission brief for the regiment. I said it's, an, it's a movement to contact, and, and they, he wants to find the enemy main force and, and, and destroy the enemy main force. So um, based on that, how do you think the regimental commander is going to react to your suggestion? Well, when you uh, start putting more and more enemies into the, the battle space, that might be a, a hint on that could be the, the main force of the enemy. Yeah, we're, I mean, looking we're looking at a regiment here, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, they, we've identified, you know, tanks, a, APCs, infantry fighting vehicles coming down Highway 12 for as far as the eye can see. And now we've got another maneuver element swinging around from the south side of, of Hill 219. I mean, this, this sounds like this is it. Does it, this sounds like this may be the fight that the regimental commander is looking for. Is that, is that kind of where you're going? Yeah, but I can only see this as um, only this picture and the regiment maybe have a, a bigger picture. So that's just my suggestion. Mm -hmm. And they can uh, take the bait and, uh, and follow my suggestion. I'll turn it out because they might have some other intelligence in the area. Uh, so Odin, what do you think of this new line of thought? Um, yeah, I think what you're saying there sounds like the what's really going on, which is we've we've while we're guarding the regiment's advance, the the context of the regiment is is actually this is the this is yeah this is what they're looking for. 
So, so it's incumbent on us now to try to develop this situation to the, to the best of our ability to fit into, you know, the, the regiment's higher sort of intent and, and create the most advantageous conditions for the regiment to carry out their mission of, of locating and destroying the enemy main force. So how do we, how do we shape this situation to do that? I think given this line of thinking, we need to let the, so far as we can, let, let the column continue to advance. While they have their own uh, guards, I'm sure there's not, it's not just that one below Hill 219. Um, while they might have their own screening and guarding forces around them, we need to let the column keep going. We, we want it to stay in column so that the regiment can deploy. Admittedly, it's not much space and time for them to do so, but um, we're wanting to given given they're in column like that we want to change from from guard to screening effectively so that we we let them continue and and, and can report to the regiment and offer options so right so as a to quote Patton again ho- ho- grab them by the nose so that somebody else can kick them in the pants correct yeah okay um bambi what do you think so I think uh, given the change in situation, I think that, that the plan outlined, it, it makes sense. Um, from where we've got to this discussion point, I think there is overwhelming force. Our squadron is now facing what we assume, given the intelligence picture, could be the main body of enemy force. Um, I hope that our intelligence picture told us it was an enemy regiment and therefore we're able to establish that this is is the main body. Um, my concern would be if if there was actually the picture was it's even larger given the potential threat. Um, sure, but sure. If, if if that's the intelligence picture, we'll have to go with it. Um, and, and and now we're getting to the point where it doesn't really matter what a troop in reserve is going to do. Um, we need to to bring the main body on to defeat this if that's the plan for the advanced contact of the regiment. Over. Okay, Baldrick. Um. Yeah. I mean the situation's changed so the mission has changed right so we either screen or fix okay essentially all right and is anybody reading it differently at this point or have, so have, have i read us down a, a garden path I've got, I, I worry that yeah. there's i worry that there's still a regiment to the north sure I, I worry that suddenly so i don't think if so I worry about two things. One is I worry about our ability to to change the course of action of the regiment, which is is uh, may or may not be um, which may or may not be plausible. Uh, but regardless of that, uh, what I worry about is that the I don't think this necessarily changes the initial thing. It, it is a supposition, which might well work. And if that does work, I do think the idea of of hitting them, forcing to deploy, and withdrawing still achieves that goal because it still means that they are deploying to engage us, which means they're going to be hit in the flank by the regiment. Great. My, yeah, my worry and my concern is that suddenly focusing on the obvious threat means that we're avoiding the overall picture. Right, but that, I mean, that's not ultimately our responsibility. That's, that's the higher headquarters responsibility. We're, we're painting the picture and developing the situation as best we can. And really? in the course of doing what we've done, we've, we've figured out that it's a much bigger enemy force than we had originally expected. Um, and so we're dealing with it um, and it's up to the regimental commander to decide whether he wants to commit to this or continue to hedge his bets or sure. do something different altogether. But it sounds like you're, you're trying to come up with a plan that allows us to sort of accomplish whatever, you know, whether it's still the original mission or the mission has changed to becoming the fixing force for the regiment to attack into the flank of the enemy. You're trying to come up with a concept of operations that allows us to sort of cover all of our bets. Not quite. Um, no. what, I'm suge- what I'm suggesting is that the same course of action works in both directions. And that, yes, I think you're right. That it doesn't matter about what the original commander is, commander is doing, because that's not our responsibility, which also means that essentially my opinion about what they're doing doesn't matter at this point. Um, my opinion about what, what I'm doing has to be about what our force is doing to best achieve the mission, which, as I said, I think is, is, to, is to report and to engage and withdraw. Um, but engaged, engaged to a point where they are forced to engage us and they're forced to take an action to, to respond to what we're doing. And at that point, I think we're achieving our goals no matter what happens, because I think we're doing, we're doing our job. Okay. Hurricane, uh, main takeaway for you from, from this experience? Oh, thanks, John. Um, is it right if I said, I'm not going to talk about the plan, I'm just going to talk about how I think you've covered tonight? 
So I want no, to- I want you to talk about the plan. I want you to say your main takeaway from this scenario, the, the main tactical lesson that you've got out of it. Oh, okay. I think the main tactical lesson I've taken out from it is um, that the longer it takes for you to take action, the more the situation changes and the more your assumptions may have been proved false. Mm-hmm. as judged by the amount of icons that are now on the map versus when we started. Okay. Well, I mean, but I mean, we've played it out over time, so it's not like they just materialized. The situation has has continued to develop. It has developed quickly. I'll, I'll give you that. Doom, your main takeaway. So I, I mean, sort of in the more in the thought process of what if, what if, what if. Yes. Okay. Um, by which time the column has moved another kilometer and a half down the road, and your ability to do something dynamic and violent in the flank is gone because you were thinking about the. We've had thought, talks about the regimental. No, I've I've given you guys credit for for hitting the tanks in the flank, and and I would I I give Bambi credit for hitting the IFVs in the flank with with his uh, with his first troop too. So it's not like we were static and they kept moving. Um, we we uh, at least I was envisioning that we were implementing our initial decisions and the situation continued to develop. But you didn't see it that way. You thought you thought I was continuing to move the enemy, although we were kind of stuck. No, no, I saw. I did see it developing. I'm, I'm. It, it, it. There was a comment in the chat which sort of stuck with me. I'm, I'm trying to make this more of a temporal thing about decision making, less about yeah. sort of tactical. Because, uh, someone's saying your first decision followed by your second after you've had five minutes to look at it, followed by your third kind of thought process after you've listened to everyone else, and it's, and it's that kind of thing about trying to, trying to train the third level quality stuff through, but not have the time it takes to get to that level is the kind of goal we're trying to go okay. through yeah i apologize i have I, I find it impossible when i'm doing this to um to also um keep up with the chat um if brendan were here that what that's one of the things he would be doing is he'd be following the chat and curating the, the chat discussion and then introducing the points that he thought needed to be brought into the to the conversation so i apologize for so I, I just now realize that there was a very um rich discussion going on um that um that I wasn't party to. So anyway, um, okay. Um, Odin, your main takeaway from the tactical scenario. Um, I suppose it's when you're told to uh, guard you for, for any sort of task, you've also, you're not just trying to fulfill that mission. You're also thinking about when that needs to change. Sure. When that should instead be a screen or a cover. Yeah. And, and also thinking about how how your actions serve the intent of the higher commander and, and not just his intent, but also his concept of operations, his, his broader mission. Um, and so understanding that if his mission is changing, i.e. he sees this as his main target now, um, then, um, you know, your actions have, have got to be in consonance with supporting that. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about the methodology a little bit, because Hurricane wants to talk about the methodology a little bit. Um, What's your reaction to that, Bambi? Struggling to find the unmute button is always painful. It's like the real comms issue. Um, I think the format um, is really useful, to be honest. Um, I think the 60 seconds, I'll be honest, and you're going to say that. When I was ready to read out my plan, I'm like, yeah, I've had plenty of time to edit it. This is brilliant. Um, but if I look back at, and I'm honest with myself about the first 60 seconds, I'm like, that's rubbish. Um, and I think that the I really like the format because it's, I think Ed, uh, mess- sorry, Hurricane messaged and said, I think this is probably the most tactical you know, we've been in the past year in terms of in 10 minutes, we've done the most tactical thinking and the tactical discussion that we have in the past year. Um, so for me, I really like the methodology. I think for me, it just highlights how um, the lack of, um, I'm not succinct enough and that we need to really practice that with sets and reps to get better at it so we can actually deliver something that's useful after just 60 seconds. Over. Yes. Uh, so so Brendan, Brendan talks about three lines in 30 seconds or five lines in 50 seconds, right? Uh, as sort of being the standard for given orders. I will tell you, we did this with a group of, of cadets for nine months during COVID. Uh, every Thursday night for nine months, 30, 38 different scenarios by the time we were done. The, their ability to, to give concise and clear and compelling orders just improved exponentially just from repeated practice because it is a skill that, that requires practice and there's an art form to it and, and you get better the more you do. Um, it, it's absolutely true. Yeah. 
Did you, when, when, when I gave you, when I finished the scenario and I started the clock, did you get kind of get that feeling in the pit of your stomach? Like, Oh crap. Yes. And yeah. I, I, I started writing as quickly as I possibly could. Um, and it was hilarious because I, I had a plan, but what, I, what was important was I hadn't been able to articulate it in all the ways you said succinctly um, and, and with purpose. And I, then after that, I got to write it down. And then I, I tried to keep honest and not change the plan, but I knew I'd still not necessarily failed, but I've learned that I need to get better in practice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I had a pit in my stomach because I'm like, I've got an idea, I've got a plan, how do I communicate it? And I think that's the key skill to learn. You can even be good at the tactical decision making, but you still need to learn how to communicate it because that's what's critical for your subordinates and higher. Uh, it doesn't matter if you come up with a great best tactical plan, but if you can't communicate it with anyone, it's worthless over. Right. The brilliant, brilliant. Um Yes. And it, it, it's, I I'd always take it as a sign of a good scenario. When you get that, that pit in your stomach, if you've, if you've got, if you've got that visceral reaction out of the, the students, then, you know, you've developed a pretty good scenario for them. Um, because that's, I mean, that's the reality, right? Um, questions, comments, other comments about, about the, the methodology, uh, why I did things the way I did it, uh, or why I didn't do other things. Um, yeah. From anybody colonial just again to say this is amazing i love it i want to do another one next time that you're available to do it please give us a shout okay um and the uh, takeaways first one thinking about what higher commands is doing and what the um your mission is actually to do rather than just seeing red and going for the target um red paths comment about yes it's not as simple as saying shoot north thinking about people are stupid how do you make this foolproof and adding the extra layers on it and the comment that was just made about you know how to communicate that plan it's very easy to come up with a lovely drawing of it actually putting that over the radio was not possible for me before tonight it's like trying to trying to tell somebody in words how to tie their shoe right that's kind of what the, the way i the analogy that i make just trying to explain to somebody how to tie their shoe it's almost impossible um and it's the same kind of it's the same kind of issue here yeah, I, I agree. I agree. You've um you've talked previously about last time we uh, last time we spoke on this on this uh, webinar. You talked previously about doing uh, alternative versions of the same TDG with with twists with with things that have gone wrong or things were there. What kind of things? I mean, what kind of things? What would what would be the next step here? If you like, what would be the the twist version of this that was so i so this scenario this this flank guard scenario actually um had four variations that all appeared in the marine Corps gazette the the first variation is it develops the same way that that it does but instead of you having the element of surprise um um first platoon or first troop gets discovered on hill 214 and they start taking fire and and they report that the enemy in the in the on the road immediately starts maneuvering with purpose, right? They, you know, they, they just, you know, go into high gear and they start doing sagger dances and they start, you know, maneuvering for, you know, into firing positions and that sort of stuff. And so the, the ver one variation is that they've, they've achieved the element of surprise. The other variation is, is what I started to play here at the end with an, the, the enemy has another axis coming around from the south side of Hill 219. So you're, you're in, in danger of now being uh, flanked. So that's, that's a variation. And then the third variation is it just, you just continue to play it out, you know, so the enemy gets all the way down to, you know, say, you know, down into this area and, um, you know, you've hit them, you've knocked out a couple of tanks, you've knocked out a couple of, of I, uh, IFVs, but they're continuing to move. And now you're sort of in this position of having this running gun battle as, you know, they move down the highway and you, you sort of bound uh, down the highway, you know, from position to position, right? Um, as it goes, what's your next move at that point when the when the, the situations develop to, to to that point? So those are the those are the kind of variations that you would do. Another way, which I never did with with this scenario, but I do it with a lot of scenarios, is I reverse it. And um, in this case, you're the advance guard for the regiment's movement um, towards Zamaville on Highway 12, heading southwest. And you run into an enemy force at checkpoint uh, 35, right? So it's the exact same scenario, exact same terrain. You're just playing it now from the red point of view. And, and the thing that I find fascinating about those is, is after I've done a scenario from the blue point of view, 
and I flip flop it to the red point of view, you would see it, it's amazing to me how few people who knowing how they did it when they were blue don't even take that into consideration when they're playing red. It, it, they just, they, it, it doesn't occur to them to wait, wait a second, I've already done this and I've done it from the other side. I ought to know how to deal with this problem. It's like it just ex exits their brain and, and they don't even realize that they've done the same problem from the other side before. It's, it's a do, fascinating thing. Do you find it's common that people are blinkered as to what is physically on the map or to not consider what the enemy are going to do after you make a move? Um, yes, initially, yes to both initially. They tend to see what I see is what's there, right? And they, and they would not consider, I thought it was really insightful to, um, I don't remember who said it almost off the bat. Well, we might've missed their, event, their, their recce unit already and there could be more coming from behind them. That's, that to me is, is a fairly advanced sort of thought process because beginners will say, I, what I see is what's there, right? Um, so very definitely. And then, um, yes, initially the enemy is static. The enemy is inanimate and I'm just going to do what I want, not realizing that anything I do, uh, the enemy is going to react to, or even if I don't do anything, even if I just sit and watch for a little bit, um, the enemy is going to do something and the situation is going to change. But again, if you do it often enough, as with the, you know, the students that I had for nine months, they will, that will become integral to their thinking, that they're immediately thinking anything I do, the enemy is going to do, and, and I can start to anticipate what I think he's likely to do and why. Yeah. Uh, Red Path and then Heka. Mute button. Right. Hecka. Yeah, hmm. Hannibal, uh, do you have any experience uh, doing this on battalion or brigade level? I know that you didn't have a, a staff to support you in your decision making, uh, but, but do you have any experience? Yes. Um, I, I Personally, I think battalion level problems um, work the best. Uh, because battalion is is the, the level where you're truly fighting off of a map. And this is a map based exercise, even at the company level, you're working off a map, but it's also what you see in front of you. And it's even more so it's, it's much harder to do, for example, a squad level problem, because a squad leader is not typically fighting off the map, he's, he's fighting off of the panorama in front of him, right. Um, so I, I think these scenarios lend themselves to the battalion level really, really well. When you get higher than battalion level, you get more and more resources and, and there's more staff involvement. And it's, it's not so much about the decision in the moment. It's more sort of deliberative and that sort of thing. So personally, I think battalion is really kind of a sweet spot. Um, yes, yeah, so at the battalion level, you have a staff, but, but this is still sort of an in the moment decision where you're not going to go through the military decision-making process and develop three courses of action and war gain them and that sort of thing. This is, this is a frag order situation. So it's still the battalion commander or the battalion commander in conjunction with his three, um, but, or he's, he's directing his air officer or his FSC, but it's still sort of executive. It's not, it's not deliberative and, and, and plan-based. Um, anyway, does, so I, I, I think I was all over the map there. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. great. Uh, that's because I'm a teacher in the Danish command and staff course. So I think about introduce this to our students. Okay. All right. Um, Dirty Ninja. Hey, John, this is absolutely brilliant. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Like, like uh, everyone had already, the discussion has been rich. Um, as far as technique, you know, obviously facilitation, you, know, you have loads of experience and talent doing this. So to do this more often, oh. I mean, that's where we're going to have to really, you know, we want to do more often to make decisions. And yeah, we second that. Decisions. Yeah. Um, we probably, yeah. you know, we need to probably train facilitators because um, I don't think you need to step off and as good as you might be, you know, average leader, kind of practice in a small group having to go and then do it more widely. So there's got to be a, what's your approach to teaching facilitation? It, it, it is hard. It, it's, I would say it's probably harder than it looks. Um, I would say if, if, if people tend to make mistakes, um, the kind of mistakes they tend to make are lecturing and telling people what the right answer is and, and why, um, and just, you know, telling them why their solutions are screwed up. 
um, rather than asking, well, why did you consider, you know, as I was, I asked why a lot, what were you thinking? What's, what's your thought process there? What are you going for? Um, what's the enemy story? Um, I'm trying to draw out thought process more than just sort of say this was this was right and this was wrong. So so one of the mistakes that you you often tend to get is is um, just sort of the lecturing or sort of sitting in judgment, which kind of cuts off conversation. I mean, the whole idea is to try to generate a rich discourse, which I think we were able to do today and and make it the kind of environment where people feel like they can jump right in and start making suggestions, which you all did. Right. Um, I mean, people were raising their hand, waiting for their chance to speak. That's a, that's a good thing when it starts running, running itself. And I don't have to be pulling stuff out of people. Then I think you've sort of created the right atmosphere and, and made it work. And so the mistakes are it becomes very sort of rigid and dictatorial. And you answer when I tell you to answer. And then I tell you what's wrong with your answer. And, and then I tell you what the right answer is that you should have known all along because you're an idiot. You know, that's that approach, which you see, because we get a lot of those kind of people in the military, I think, um, that's where you tend to go wrong. So um, it, it does take practice. Um, you really need to be familiar with the scenario. So you don't get, you know, somebody doesn't throw something at you, and you have no idea how to respond to it. I've done this scenario enough now that I, I don't, I haven't gotten surprised in a while. Um, but I've but I've been surprised in TDGs where somebody gives me some outside the box thing that I'm like, whoa, i I'm not sure how to react to that, right? And what I usually just say is why. If I'm stumped, <laughs> I just go with why. Tell me what you're thinking. And, and then, you know, like that gives me time to sort of, you know, get my feet under me again and, and uh, get my bearings. But it really, it really, really helps to understand the scenario deeply, to understand the terrain implications and the movement rates and all the different perturbations that I could throw into it you know, to make it more interesting based on, on where the conversation is going and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, that really, really helps. So um, the scenarios that you author, I think tend to be, you know, the best ones for you. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't do somebody else's scenario. Um, I just always found that I, I just feel more comfortable with my own because I, I built them. So I, you know, I, I tend to understand them better than anybody else. It was phenomenal, John, and uh, we're, you've been very generous with your time and such a degree of humility and like you've been yeah, this is really great i mean i think you can see from the comments or you can't see because you haven't had a chance to look at them but a lot of people have been uh, very grateful for the time you've taken with us to to do this which we should be doing all the time um apparently so we get better decision making but i think you know we want to be respectful to your time so i'll turn it over to ed ed you want to close out with you got anything else for john Any other resources that you would recommend to read outside of this in order to facilitate this? Not sorry, not facilitate the session, but in order to make better decision making for this. Um. Yeah, I, I will look. There, there is there is a um, a workbook that the Marine Corps University put out on facilitating and designing good TDGs. Um, I can send a copy of that to Ed. Um, did I did I send you a PDF version of Mastering Tactics, my TDG workbook? We got it. We can send it out, John. Okay, um, there's that. Um, I'm happy to send you um, some of my uh, PowerPoint version TDGs if you if you want to start using them yourself. I'm I, I don't mind if you do that at all. So yes, Ed, Ed, if you and I want to talk, I you know we can figure out uh, some good ones to send you guys, and then you can play with them on your own. Ed's not answering Eddie. Worth calling Hurricane. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, what was that? <laughs> See, Hurricane, you've got to close out. And uh, the key thing there was the offer of uh, some of the TDGs. And I think we'd absolutely love to uh, take some of those PowerPoints um, and really would appreciate that. Uh, and from our perspective, what we want to do is, is play them through as TDGs and maybe try and build some of them in combat mission as well, because we want to do both the kind of TDG development, which we absolutely learning development, which we think is vital. And then later on, we want to see maybe some uh, tactical gaming. But Ed, were there any final points from yourself? Or oh, sorry, Hurricane. Correction over. Yeah, Hurricane is the last transmission. Um, no, I think this is great. Um, I'll admit I've never done this before. So actually putting yourself through the time limit, really, really demanding and, and trying to brief that succinctly on the radio. Definitely want to do some in units. Uh, and I think like you said in the webinar, just doing it and getting better by iteration so you get to the quality of that. You know, John is as a facilitator where he seamlessly deals with 15 different variations of the theme 
draws the scenario into depth, adding icons and, and, and focusing on different things and making no one feel like they're an absolute idiot uh, or, or proving that there's a right way to do it, which I think was excellent. Um, so uh, let me, Hurricane, let me just ask you real quick. I know we need to get going. Um, based on, on the, the webinar that Brendan and I gave last time, is this what you expected it to be? Yeah, I, I, so it was what I expected it to be at the start. And then by the end, I was like, wow, there's a lot of depth here that I wasn't really, you know, there's the okay. chat, there's the other things people say, there's the the nuances, the, you know, the huge amounts of depth and value. And, I, you know, as I say, I did, I've learned, I've sort of talked about my profession more here than I have in, you know, the entire year I've been in command of a subunit. And that that's not, that's not good for anyone. So um, yeah, it's been really, it's been really good. I just, I just hope this can be sort of rolled out and actually uh, done because doing it here is fine, but this is a community of people who are interested and right. it's those who don't know about it that need to know about it and and be, be part of it. All right. Well, happy to try to help. So let's um, you and I continue to talk. Let me just make one last commercial. The Naturalistic Decision Making Association is a is a group of researchers and practitioners that look at these kinds of decisions in all domains, firefighting, police, military, child protective services, um, petroleum industry, politics. Um, we have a conference coming up in Orlando, the 25th through the 27th of October. Um, I, I don't expect that a lot of you would be able to travel to it, but if you have, if you have the option to travel, um, um, it's going to be really interesting. There's going to be a number of these kinds of, of exercises in a variety of different domains. It's we're going to focus on practice as opposed to, to academic research this year. So yeah, if you're interested and you, and you have the latitude, I, I, I'd encourage you to give it a look. Yes. Is that with Gary, Gary Klein, John? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it, that's Gary's movement, uh, naturalistic, naturalistic decision making. We are going to um, provide a, a limited number of offerings online. Uh, for people that can't travel uh, and maybe a TDG or, or two. So, so that's also an option, but I throw it out there. I know it's unlikely that, that most of you would be able to do it, but if you have, you know, the wherewithal, I think it'll be a really interesting three days. But let's keep, let's keep working on this uh, hurricane. Yeah, don't can, worry. Can, you, can you say again, can you say again, the, um, the society or organization? Sorry, I, I, it, you broke up. It's the Naturalistic Decision Making Association. Go to naturalisticdecisionmaking.org. Roger, thanks very much. Yeah. yeah and also, just because I read it recently, Jim Storr's book on um, something rotten, which take, tears apart um, land command decision making as it currently is known. But he talks about naturalistic, naturalistic decision making a lot. So that's also something if you want to go into some depth, uh, although you're going to shell out at least half a tank of petrol to buy it.